If Doom runs on everything, and I mean it even has its own subreddit for what it runs on, why not have one instance of Doom run on everything? And while I'm at it, why not just let Twitch control the Doom guy? This actually sounds pretty easy, right? Just have Twitch show Doom and then everyone can run around using Twitch chat, right? Well, it turns out that the average Twitch experience is over five seconds behind, but I tried it anyways, and it took Twitch over one minute to open this door. Obviously, the whole ASCII Doom thing was probably a little bit weird, but hey, hear me out. I've been exploring this idea of a real-time game engine, but it's all ASCII, so I thought using Doom as like a test bed would be a great idea. Because I wanted everyone to be able to see the same game at the same time and be able to play it together on Twitch like a happy family. A very degenerate family, but a happy family nonetheless. Technically, Minesweeper was the first game that I ever did, and yes, it is being displayed in NeoVim, and yes, Twitch is not that great at Minesweeper. Therefore, I'm gonna have to create my own packet formula, my own network compression, and my own web display to be able to have Doom displayed everywhere. Not because I need to, but because I can. Therefore, I just have to build a couple pieces. First, I just need to be able to build a program that can spawn the ASCII program, parse out all the data, frame it, and send it up to a server. Now, this server is going to have to be able to take in a bunch of connections from all the clients coming in and be able to send down all of that packetized, frameized, whateverized data so that the clients can happily see it on their computer. And of course, in life, there's two things that are unavoidable. One, death. Two, engineers that chronically underestimate how difficult things will be. This is the first frame of Doom displayed in ASCII. This is that same frame, but this is the ANSI codes that actually are required to display Doom in those colors. ANSI always starts off with an escape code, followed by an open bracket, followed by a command. One colon one moves the cursor to the top left of the screen. 2J clears the screen. Colon H is shorthand for move the cursor to the top left of the screen. 1M makes any succeeding characters bold. 38 colon 2 colon 116 colon 001 colon 001M will color any text dark red. Then finally, we're followed by two L's, which is almost as many L's as the average Twitter post. And that's how you get two dark red L's. Every color has its own escape sequence. So now to parse out the frame, I had to look for slash R slash N's, or as I like to call them, a registered nurse. And of course, the semicolon H to denote the end of a frame. And boom, there we go, we're done. We've parsed out all the data. Now I can easily send it up to my relay server, which will relay it out to all the clients. Like, that was actually it. That's pretty easy, right? Well, this is where things took a little bit of a dramatic turn. Instead of being done with the project, I really just started the project. So let's think about it this way. Every single frame contains a bunch of characters and a bunch of colors, right? So that means I'm gonna have to store the characters I want to send, plus the color of those characters. By the way, this is the American spelling of colors, the proper way, okay? No colors around here. Now, if each color takes three bytes to store, one byte for red, one for blue, and one for green, green of course being in the middle, and then one byte for the ANSI character, because ANSI is really a seven bit, but you know, you typically store an eight. That means it's four bytes per little character. Now there wasn't that many characters. There was 212 characters by 66. So that's probably not that many, right? Well, if you happen to multiply that by four, you get about 56,000 bytes per frame. There's 30 frames a second. There's gonna be a thousand users. That'd be one gigabyte per second or anywhere between two to 12 cents per second if I were to run this on Fly.io. You know, I like you guys, but I don't really want to spend something like $150 an hour to have Doom run. So that means I'm gonna have to create my own compression algorithms because again, I just want to do it, okay? I just want to. I want to go and explore something I've never built before because honestly, that's what makes engineering fun is just reinventing the wheel and seeing how well you can do. So first I had to create a baseline test. So I actually let Doom just run and I'd let it run for 10,000 frames. And then I would determine how much data would I have to send up to the relay server to see, am I making my encoding better or am I making it worse? So just doing nothing would be about 545 megabytes worth of data sent for 10,000 frames of data. I think I could probably do a lot better than that. You know, I think I'm a pretty smart fella, so I figured if I could just look, I just look at the ASCII, maybe something will stand out. How about you look at the ASCII? Does anything stand out to you? Here, I'll zoom in. Does anything stand out here? 
If you look closely, you'll see that each character is duplicated. That means I can take out half the data and then reproduce it on the client side. And with that one little change, we are now down to 272 megabytes for 10,000 frames. Okay, better, not good, better though. All right, so I wanna do this again. Now look at this. If you look at the screen carefully, you will notice something. White characters are always dollar signs. W's tend to be really light colors. Dark colors tend to be really small characters. And of course, looking at the Doom code, it did turn out they generate the ASCII based on the brightness of the color. So that means I could drop every single character, and on the other side, I could just generate the character based on the brightness of each cell. This change took us from 272 megabytes to 204 megabytes. This was a big improvement. So my next idea, a bit controversial, I took the red, the green, and the blue, and instead of having a byte for each, I projected each one into a single byte. So red would take the first three bits of a byte, green would take the next two bits, and blue would take the final three bits, which led to this definitely not an abomination code. And of course that change brought us from 204 to 68 megabytes for 10,000 frames. Okay, now we're cooking. Now we're making some actual progress here. Then there's another thing I noticed. Look at this load screen. Did you notice that it didn't change a whole bunch? Well, why send duplicate frames? I bet you there's a bunch of duplicate frames. Yep, there was. We went from 68 to 35 megabytes for 10,000 frames. Now these changes have all been good, but I haven't really actually compressed the data. I'm really just taking stuff out and implicitly hydrating it again on the client. Or in the case of colors, just making it kind of look ugly. So now it's time to actually start doing some compression. So at this point, I knew I probably need to start pursuing maybe some more sophisticated techniques. The first technique I pursued was actually called RLE. I've used this once in the past, I didn't know its name, but effectively it just means run length encoding. So let's pretend you had the following string, www.ddmegadoodoo.r. If I were to compress this with run length encoding, what I do is I look at the first character, then at the next character. If they're the same, I keep going, and I keep going, and I keep going until I encounter a character that's not the same, and then go 5w. So I took five bytes and compressed it into two bytes. So if there's a nice run length of the same items, you can really compress well. So this D becomes 2D, and then this R becomes 1R. And as you can see with the R, it actually encoded it worse because it took up two characters instead of one. The D was the exact same, but the W we really won on. And when I look at the data, like you'll notice that there's like a whole bunch of L's in a row. There's a whole bunch of in a row right there. So I figured this has to produce some sort of win, right? Yes, it did. We're down to 28.9 megabytes. Okay, we're winning. But we could actually make this even better. I don't know if you know anything about XOR. XOR is a bitwise operation, but something that's unique about XOR is that it actually has memory. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say that you have A and it equals 1100, zero, zero, and you have B equals 1010. Zero, zero. If you were to XOR these two together or exclusive OR them together, which means that if there's one one, then it's a one. If there's two ones, it's a zero, or two zeros, it's a zero. We would produce the following. So I'm gonna set A, to the results of this. So that'd be zero, 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 one, 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 zero, one, one, one. Again, that's not exclusively or zero. Now with this value right here, I can recreate either of these values using the opposite. Let me show you what I mean by this. I'm gonna assign B the XOR of these two. So zero, 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 one, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one. Notice now that B is the value of A. We just swapped B and A. So if I were to redo this one last time with A, I could actually now have A equal B by doing zero, one, zero, one. A is now equal to B. B is now equal to A. We swap the values without ever having a temporary variable. This is actually one of the fundamental basis of forward error correction in WebRTC. What it does, it takes all of your packets and then adds one more packet at the end that is the XOR of all the previous ones because if you only miss one packet, it can actually restore that by XORing any of those together. Remember, WebRTC uses UDP, which is an unreliable program and it doesn't even come in order. So let's actually apply this to our frames. That means we could take frame zero and we could XOR it with frame one. This is gonna produce a frame XOR. 
That means if we have frame zero that has almost the exact same image as frame one, we're gonna largely produce a frame that will be just a bunch of zeros. And then the place that it's not will have some ones. And if we use the previous frame, we can generate the next frame because remember, XOR has memory. That means if we combine XOR plus RLE, we could potentially get a whole bunch of zeros in a row and then just get really nice run length encoding. And it does turn out that is the case. We are now down to 21.8 megabytes for 10,000 frames. We are now better, but we need more. So let's talk about the next thing we're gonna do. We're gonna bring in Huffman encoding. If you've never done Huffman encoding, like I never did up until this thing, I've never even tried to build it. It was tons of fun to try to build, but how Huffman encoding works is really simple. Let's say we have the following string, A, B, C, A, B, D, A. What Huffman does is first takes the frequency of every single character. So there's three A's, two B's, one C, one D. We're gonna take these four values and we're gonna put them into a min heap. If you're not familiar with the min heap, it's pretty dang simple. It just takes the smallest values and will pop them first. There's no other guarantee in order other than removing the smallest elements. So what we're gonna do is remove two elements at a time and combine them. So we'll start off with these two. We have a C on one side and we have a D on the other side. Then we're gonna add those two numbers together and put it back into the priority queue. So now we're gonna remove the next two minimum ones right here, which is gonna be this kind of amalgamation of C and D and 2B, which is gonna create the following tree. We're gonna have B on one side and then we're gonna have our C and D on the other side. Now we have a weight of four, 2B plus 211. Put that back into our min heap. Pop up the next two and we're gonna get the following. We're gonna have A on one side and then we're gonna have B on the other side. Now we take this tree and we actually give it some binary values. We put a zero on the left-hand side, a one on the right-hand side. And you just keep on doing this all the way down. Now we actually have our encoding for A, B, C, and D. So originally A, B, C, and D is actually stored with seven bytes. But using Huffman encoding, we can actually store it with only two bytes. So check this out. A is just a zero, okay, zero. B is one, zero. C is one, one, zero. A is just zero. B is one, zero. D is one, one, one. And the final A is a zero. That means we still have three bits left in which we're just gonna put little X's right here because we don't need those. But this is now our Huffman encoded bits. And you can see something unique about this. You can never run into a situation in which you have an ambiguous result. When I parse out the first bit, it's a zero. It goes to a definite character within the tree. You can never have one bit potentially go two different directions. So it's always unique. You just simply need to know how many bits were encoded because you could run into the situation where you have some extra junk at the end, which would thus cause potentially bad encoding. Now adding in Huffman, we are down to 15.99 megabytes, okay? This is looking good for 10,000 frames. And of course, if I take all the strategies and combine them together, it actually gets us all the way down to 13 megabytes. That is looking so good. That means approximately every five minutes and 30 seconds, it will cost me about 1.3, 1.4, 1.5 gigabytes. Now we're talking, okay? I don't mind spending five to $10 on your degenerates. Per hour, of course, per hour. Lastly, I just had to figure out how to get Twitch to control it. Now, this was actually a pretty fun little exercise. So Twitch chat just like floods in with all the characters. And what I decided is that I will measure for 250 milliseconds and then take out the most occurring value, say this W. And then for the next 250 milliseconds, do the exact same thing. And what I'll do is during this measurement period, I will play out the W every 16 milliseconds to simulate it being held. And this is it. And that's all I had to do is just feed those keys back into the game and then I should be able to play this. I do wanna make a shout out to Stuart. He actually gave me a server for me to run this for free with really high bandwidth and actually made this a success. So hey, thanks Stuart, appreciate that stunt dev, let's go. And we did all of that work just to watch Twitch chat be defeated by some stairs. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. And again, failing on stairs. And again, failing on stairs. And again, failing on stairs. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. No. 
And of course, this ultimately ended with us actually winning. It was a clincher. Maybe I set the difficulty to the lowest difficulty, but we got it. Okay, we got it. Yeah, that's right. Me from the past. We were so pumped. And then all they had to do was walk through this door, of course, which was just so painful to watch. And also, if you'll notice that Twitch chat would like freeze and then we couldn't move because we were sending too many characters. We are hitting the limit of Twitch and boom, beat the level. Let's go. High five me. Yeah. Yeah. And there you go. That's what it looks like when a thousand people beat Doom together. The pure raw athleticism that was missing the staircase repetitively but nonetheless they did it so hey give this video a like hey subscribe name your child after me give me your twitch blue crown subscribe to my vs code only fans where i do some real dirty javascript coding the name is the primogen